We only wear the finest of fashion on this channel. Hello, and welcome to Squid Think. When most people think about science, they probably think about the things you learn in school. So like the Krebs cycle, photosynthesis, the periodic table. They might even think of They might even think of maths. Whereas what they should be thinking about, in my opinion, is levitating frogs using magnets and chickens with sticks on their butts. So today we're going to be talking about studies that have awarded humanity with not only knowledge, but with humour. Today we're discussing the top five funniest Ig Nobel Prize winners. The Ig Nobel Prize is slightly different to the uh, normal Nobel Prize, because with the normal Nobel Prize you get things like money and credibility. The Ig Nobel Prize was started in 1991 by Mark Abrams, who is the co-founder and editor of a scientific humour magazine called The Annals of Improbable Research. The award was created to award scientists who had done research that not only made people think, but also made people laugh. From myth-busting studies, like do cracking my joints give me arthritis? The answer is no, by the way. To things that are just plain silly, like gluing a grasshopper to a table to measure its predatory avoidance system. This is their mascot. He's called the Stinker. Do you get it? It's a pun. It's play on words. Do you get it? It's funny. But anyway, without further ado, let's get into the list. The first prize on our list is the Statistics Prize of 1998. This was awarded to Gerald Bain and Kerry Szymanowski, who found that foot length, height, and penile size have no correlation whatsoever. So yeah, if you've ever heard anyone be like, you know what they say about big feet? You can be like, no, I don't know what they say about big feet because that was disproved in 1998 by Kerry Szymanowski. The report was titled The Relationships Among Height, Penile Length and Foot Size found in the volume six of Annals of Sex Research. Annals of Sex Research. Great title. For the 63 participants, they measured their height, their stretched penile length and their foot size. And the results of the study were that penile length was found to be statistically related to both body height and foot length but with a weak correlation coefficient. Heights and foot size would not serve as a practical estimator of penile length. So there you have it folks, science strikes again. Personally, I think they should redo the study with uh, tiny hands just because I really want that joke about Trump to stand up. But you know, if the science dictates, then you know, we'll just have to find something else to make fun of about him. What a hardship. Number two on the list is the physics prize for 2017 awarded to Marc Antoine Fardin. Fardin? Sardine. Any French people, please tell me in the comments how the hell to pronounce that. He was awarded the prize for his study on the rheology of cats, looking at whether cats are a solid or a liquid. <laughs> rheology is the branch of physics that investigates the flow of matter, so particularly things like non-Newtonian fluid, like oublec. Here's a quick extract from his studies report. What is true today may not be true tomorrow. Time over time, one day 49, the next 50. Historically, the popular distinction between states of matter has been based on quantitative differences in bulk properties. The conclusion of his study was the fact that they can adapt their shape to their container if we give them enough time. Thus, cats are a liquid if we give them enough time to become a liquid. So there you have it, guys. Cats are a liquid. Sometimes, if you give them enough time, cats are both solid and a liquid. I love science. Included in his paper was also just the best figures that I've ever seen in my life, and so I'm gonna just quickly pop them up on screen. I guarantee you, if you are going into science, or if you're already in science, you are never going to see a better figure than those. Number three on the list is a personal favourite of mine because I actually managed to get my lecturer to play a video of this in our lecture. This is the 2015 award for biology which was awarded to Bruno Grossi and his colleagues. The title of the paper was Walking Like Dinosaurs. Chickens with artificial tails provide clues about non-avian theropod locomotion. A theropod is literally just a carnivorous dinosaur, so things like T-Rexes. And basically a summary of his study was that he's stuck a rod onto the butt of a chicken and it made it walk like a dinosaur. And if that isn't science, then I'm quitting. There's a video that goes with this one, so uh, stick around. Here's an extract from his methods section. 
By experimentally manipulating the location of the center of mass in living birds, chickens raised with artificial tails and consequentially with more posteriorly located center of mass, posteriorly, posteriorly, Jesus, the only times I ever forget how to talk are when I'm filming. Posteriorly located center of mass showed a more vertical orientation of the femur during standing and increased femoral displacement during locomotion. So he's basically saying that the thigh bone of the chicken changed where it was, both while standing and during movement. Our results support the hypothesis that gradual changes in the location of the center of mass resulted in a more crouched hind limb posture and a shift from a hip driven to a knee driven limb movement through theropod evolution. They also concluded that we need to study more birds in order to learn more about dinosaurs. And here is a video of what they did during their study. Isn't that just, just wonderful? Number four on our list is the 2010 Biology Prize. This was awarded to Libiao Zhang from China and Gareth Jones from Bristol in the UK for scientifically documenting fellatio in fruit bats. It's not uncommon in science for people to dedicate their whole lives to just one piece of research or to just one part of research. It's times like now that I question people's motivations and reasons for their choice of research. Fellatio has been observed in bonobos, but it's very, very rarely seen in any species other than humans. One of the possible reasons why it might be seen in fruit bats is because fruit bats exhibit polygyny, which is basically polygamy, which is multiple partners, except with only females. So one male with multiple female partners. Here's a nice little excerpt for you from the paper. Female bats often lick their mate's penis during dorsoventral copulation. The female lowers her head to lick the shaft or the base of the male's penis, but does not lick the gland's penis, which has already been penetrated inside the vagina. A positive relationship exists between the length of time that the female licked the male's penis during copulation and the duration of copulation. Furthermore, mating pairs spent significantly more time in copulation if the female licked her mate's penis than if fellatio was absent. So if the females did perform fellatio on the males, then they spent more time mating, which means that he was spending less time mating with other females, which means that more of her genetic material gets passed on and da 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 da, bada bing, bada boom, more kids for her, less kids for them. Evolution. We're nearing the end of our list, but I thought I'd just quickly slap in an honorable mention for the Biology 2016 prize to Charles Foster and Thomas Thwaites. This was a joint win for them, but they actually did quite different studies. Similar concept, different outcomes. Charles Foster decided he wanted to live as a badger, an otter, a deer, a fox, a bird. You get the point, the guy was a fairy. Thomas Thwaites, on the other hand, went a tiny bit further than Charles, and he decided to make himself prosthetic limbs and just live among the goats. Thomas Thwaites is just living the blackadder dream. And finally, here it is, number one, the best study that I've ever read. And this was the Ig Nobel Prize for the year of 2000 for physics. This prize was awarded to Andrew Geim from the Netherlands and Michael Berry from the UK for their research on the diamagnetic levitation of a frog. Now this paper, this paper was an interesting read, but it has nothing on the video that accompanied the paper. Here's a quick explanation of the experiment from Nijmegen University in the Netherlands. I have no idea if I pronounced that right. I tried to look up how to pronounce it before this video and I've already forgotten. But anyway, here's an explanation from the university on how the experiment works. All matter in the universe consists of small particles called atoms and each atom contains electrons that circle around a nucleus. If you place an atom or a large piece of matter containing billions and billions of atoms in a magnetic field, electrons doing their circles inside do not like this very much. They alter their motion in such a way as to oppose the external influence. Incidentally, this is the most general principle of nature. Whenever you try to change something settled and quiet, the reaction is always negative. So according to this principle, the disturbed electrons create their own magnetic field. And as a result, the atoms behave as little magnetic needles pointing in the direction opposite to the applied field. Magnets push each other away if you try to bring together their like poles, for example, two north or two south poles. Similarly, the north pole of the external field will try to push away the north pole of magnetized atoms. Our magnet creates a very large magnetic field, about 100 to 1000 times larger than a household magnet. That's a lot of magnets. In this field, all the atoms inside the frog act like very small magnets, creating a small field. Although very small, such a field can be detected by a compass. Compass frog. You may say that the frog is now built up of these tiny magnets which are now repelled by a large magnet. The force, which is directed upwards, appears to be strong enough to compensate for the force of gravity which is directed downwards, 
that also acts on every single atom of the frog. So the frog's atoms do not feel any force at all, and the frog floats as if it were in a spacecraft. So first of all, before I go any further, here is the best video of any scientific paper you are ever going to see in your life. And here is the version of that video that I sent to my flatmates. <laughs> one of my favourite parts about this particular one though, is that Andrew Geim, one of the authors, actually did win a Nobel Prize. So he won the Ig Nobel Physics Prize in 2000, but he won the real Nobel Physics Prize in 2010. He won the real prize alongside Konstantin Novoselov. Novoselov. This video is really testing my dyslexia. The groundbreaking experiments they did relating to graphene. Graphene, if you don't know, is the world's strongest material and it's also the most inductive to heat. It's a one atom thick carbon based structure and it's basically the base element to things like graphite. It has a buttload of potential uses. So they're looking at using it in mechanics because it's super lightweight, in heat conduction because it's really conductive, and in energy storage, because it has a really high surface area to volume ratio, so it has the potential to store a lot of energy. But yeah guys, uh, that's my list of my top five favourite, funniest, Ig Nobel Prize winner list of research. Science is funny, this is too long of a title. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed the list, thank you so much for watching, um, and I hope to see you in the next video. If you enjoyed this video, please click the like button, because it's a free way that you can support the channel. If you want to see more videos like it, then click subscribe. And yeah, I really hope you enjoyed it, and I will see you in the next video. Thanks a lot for watching. Yeah, see you later guys. Bye. <laughs>